that melody in that song is one of those that kind of gets to me. Those words are so important. So I want to start this morning by asking you a quick question. Have you ever made plans? You thought they were the perfect plans. Maybe it was a vacation or a project at work or maybe a a project around your house. Unfortunately, many times those perfect plans are perfect until you actually tried to carry them out. And then they were slightly less than perfect. And I've experienced myself a few imperfect plans and actions. First one, there was a September cruise I planned for Mary and I for our honeymoon um, many, many years ago. And I had imagined sunny days, beautiful beaches, and instead we had clouds, rain, and a tropical storm at sea. Mary was fine. I laid in the bed seasick for 24 hours. Or then there was the the hike deep into the Rocky Mountains through beautiful snow. It was gorgeous. It it was a a point-to-point hike. In other words, it wasn't a loop. We were going from point A to point B. It was the perfect day for hiking. We didn't see another person the entire day. Unfortunately, though, that beautiful snow led to an impassable snow ledge. We had to turn back. And then me, using my great navigational skills, I tried to find us a shortcut, and we got lost. Of course, there are those times when a a change in plans can actually bring amazing rewards. Recently, some family members bought me a puppy for my birthday. Yeah, aw, come on. Aw, there you go. Well, about two weeks before we picked up little Maggie, the plans changed. And the change happened as as Mary and I were driving to her sister's for dinner. And during that 30-minute drive, we decided to get a second puppy. I can tell you six months ago, I wasn't sure about having one puppy. Mary was much less sure. Two puppies certainly were not in our plans. But Maggie and Gus have been the greatest blessing. Gus is a great brother to Maggie. You see, some plans are meant to be changed. And along those lines of plans that that change, several months ago, I laid out the the message plan for our study of Paul's um, letter to the Colossians and titled it, A New You in Christ. And as I did that, I determined which passages which would be read on which Sunday and who would cover each week. So I made a, a preaching schedule for Pastor David and I. And I think we would all agree it's been a good series. Paul's words to the Colossians make it very clear who Jesus is. But Colossians also reminds us that we definitely are new people in Christ. But way back when I made those plans, I made one significant mistake. I gave myself today's passage from Colossians 3, which I just read a few minutes ago. It's a great passage. It just doesn't always sit well with people. Last week when I looked at today's passage, my first thought was, why did I do this to myself? I could have assigned these verses to Pastor David. (laughs) I should have planned better. But then I realized this actually is a very awesome passage. As, As Kent Hughes wrote, he said, Paul has taken us from the religion of the whole universe to the religion of the kitchen and the bedroom. And, and we're just going to stick with the kitchen and change the bedroom to the family room, okay? But the point is, is we've gone from the deep Christological theology of Jesus Christ in the first couple chapters of this letter, and now we've arrived at God's guidance for the practical life of a Christian family. And it, it reminds us that the Bible is theological, but it's also practical. And I love it when a passage so clearly and so easily applies to Monday through Saturday living. If, if God's word doesn't impact our daily living, we're missing so much. 
And so this morning, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get a lot of deep theology. But you will hear some very practical, biblical wisdom for your home. And if you're working, even for your work. And if you're single or don't have kids or not working, Paul's words still apply to you. Listen carefully to see where you can apply God's teaching to the people in your life. And so let's get started with God's guidance on a relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, if we were really going to cover this topic thoroughly, it would take hours. But I'm going to take Paul's lead and be quick and to the point. Paul very succinctly wrote, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Before we go any further, we must understand that Paul was talking about a Christian home here. His words have nothing to say about a woman's role in society. You know, I can tell you, she's sitting there, I have a strong wife. Mary is amazing. As, as a cardiac nurse, her knowledge humbles me. Mary has dedicated her life to helping others. She's incredible loving. Her faith is strong. You can see she's beautiful. She's a better person than me. And in case you're wondering, yeah, you know what, I'm hoping I scored a few points this morning. <laughs> I did. She's nodding. Good deal. <laughs> but there's other women in my life close to me that also amaze me. They are creative. They are leaders. They are passionate about their faith. They accomplish more in a shorter amount of time than 99% of the guys I know. They're confident, and they're scary smart. When Paul wrote those words of submission in this passage, he wasn't saying that women can't do great things. He wasn't saying that a woman couldn't be the president of a company or the president of a nation. Paul was teaching God's guidance for a Christian home. And, and if we follow God's leading, our marriages will be stronger and our families will be stronger. Let me read Paul's words in the very beginning there again. He said, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. First off, this is a command from God. But you also have to know in Paul's time, women were little more than property. A Jewish husband could divorce his wife for any reason. She had no rights. In Greek society, a wife lived a life of seclusion. She never appeared in public alone. She often didn't even get to eat with her husband. And she was to be faithful to her husband, but he could sleep with whomever he chose. Ladies, aren't you glad you didn't live in the first century A.D.? Some of you would have broken the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Paul's message, though, concerning wives was actually radical. He was giving women an equal role with their husbands. That was unheard of at that time. The submission Paul wrote of was not what we think the word implies today. T to us, submission means that a woman is, is a doormat, that she has no rights. She's a lesser person. She's somehow unequal to her husband, and her husband is to be your master. And that is not, that is not what Paul was saying. He was elevating women while sharing the truth. In a Christian home, the husband should lead. He should set the example. The husband should be the spiritual leader of the family. He's the one that should be bringing the family to church. And sadly, we know in our society today, all you got to do is look at any church, so many husbands fail. Their wife and kids come to church and the husband's at home. But also, being the leader of the family doesn't mean that the husband's a dictator. That's not biblical leadership. The Christian wife voluntarily submits to her husband's role. She speaks her mind, and she's heard. Decisions are to be made together. She is an equal partner in the marriage. To, to say a wife submits to her husband is also to say that a wife respects her husband. She doesn't tear him down. She's his biggest fan, even when he's a knucklehead. You know, I, I know that when a husband does some knuckleheadish things, that's a new word, knuckleheadish things, it's easy for a wife to roll her eyes. 
Some of you gals with the giggles are experts at the eye roll. Resist the roll. Instead, tell your husband that you love him. And be sincere or sarcastic. Oh, honey, I love you. That's equivalent to a hearty eye roll. A godly wife encourages her husband. She has faith in his leadership. Okay, it's time to move to the guys. Paul said the husband is to love his wife and to not be harsh with her. In Ephesians 5, Paul was more specific. He wrote, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, we are to love our wife. Some of us are going to be disappointed to know that the love of which Paul wrote was not eros, our erotic love. Sorry, guys. It wasn't even filial or friendship love. But both of those are important to a marriage. But the the Greek word that Paul used for love in this passage is agape. We agape love our wife. As one writer stated, he said, agape love is the unceasing care and loving service for the wife's entire well-being. Let me say that again, guys. We've got to catch this. Sometimes we're not always listening. Agape love is the unceasing care and loving service for the wife's entire well-being. And what that means is we serve our wife and we also serve any other important women in our life. We take care of them. We protect them. And protection often means that we defend them with our words. Protection happens when we support our wife, even when we think she doesn't have it quite right. We spend time with our wife. She's our princess. And we listen to her. And this is a really hard one, because guys, it might mean turning off the football or hockey game or cutting down on the video games. Or for some of us like me, it might mean we text just a little bit less. If you're married, guys, your wife is a gift from God. A gift from God to you. Remember it. And treat her like the gift that she is. An old Psychology Today article titled Marriage is Made to Last surveyed hundreds of happily married couples. And the two top things they said kept a marriage going were, one, my spouse is my best friend. And then two, I like my spouse as a person. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. If our wife is our best friend whom we like, Paul's guidance to not be harsh with our wife makes perfect sense. Guys, if, if you're mean to your wife, do you expect her to res- do you expect her to respect you? If you're constantly criticizing her, are you demonstrating agape love? If you make cruel jokes about her in front of your friends and family, are you protecting her? No, of course not. In Ephesians, we said a minute ago, a husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. That is sacrificial love. Husbands must be willing to die for their wife. But as I tell every couple I ever married, that also means that he, the husband is willing to lead a life of sacrifice for her as well. Our wife's supposed to get the best of us, not what's left over. Loving our wife also includes praying for her. Be be specific. What does she need today? How can you ask God to help her become the woman he calls her to be? And while we're at it, we probably ought to pray that we would be a better husband. So to sum all that up, God's practical guide to marriage is this. Wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wife with a Christ-like love. That was easy, wasn't it? We got that, guys. We got that, wives, of course. So now we're going to move on to the harder stuff. Kids and grandkids or any other children in your guidance. And there's messages here for us as guardians over children, but there's also messages for children here. Verses 20 and 21 read, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. 
Paul began by children to obey their parents because, again, God commands it. It's pleasing to him. He said they're to obey in everything. And that means obedience is offered in all areas of life. That's a radical idea for a teenager to accept. But it's also a good idea. We live in, in a culture where obedience is not popular. Children actually have to be taught to obey. Many parents, I think, today have forgotten that obedience is taught. It's kind of like my dogs, Maggie and Gus. You were wondering how long I'd get before I put a picture up of them again, I know. That's a great picture, and I also included a sibling of theirs, Kobe K. The fact is, though, is we, we teach our dogs obedience. Chewing up shoes and furniture is not acceptable. Pooping on the carpet is not desirable. Biting my hands so hard that it bleeds, and that has happened quite a bit in the last two weeks, that's not great behavior. But what we do is we gently and firmly discipline our dogs. And if a dog can learn obedience, can't a six-year-old learn it as well? There were some studies conducted by Focus on the Family, and they've shown that children with the highest self-esteem come from homes where the parents were significantly stricter in their discipline. Permissive parents more often resulted in kids with low self-esteem. And I think what that's pointing out is kids need rules. It teaches them to obey. It helps them become confident adults. Now, I, before we go further, I need to make one point, and it's a very critical point. When Paul told kids to obey, it wasn't a license for parents to be cruel. That is unacceptable. It wasn't a license for abuse of any form. That's evil. It is also isn't okay to be hypercritical of our children. We want our kids to be better than us, but we have to also realize that they're kids. They're going to do dumb stuff because you know what? We did dumb stuff. Ruling with an iron fist is also not good parenting. The overly strict parent is actually the lazy parent. Just set some unrealistic rules for your kid and you're done. And when the child fails, that's not on you, that's on them. Discipline always has to be accompanied by love. Obedience is learned through love and praise. Paul said provoking or aggravating your children would discourage them, and he directed that to the men. I think we're better at that than, than the women, but women, you can do it too. We're to encourage our children. In Acts 5.29, we're also reminded to obey God rather than men. See, obedience is good. Obedience is proper. Discipline is good as long as it follows God's teaching. If the parents aren't following God, following their lead is not biblical. So live out your faith before your children, your grandchildren, and, and any other children that are in your life. Bring them to church with you and stay in church with them. Demonstrate Christ-like love in your home. When they watch mom and dad or they watch grandma and grandpa or their aunt and uncle, they ought to see something of Christ. Now the last area in family life in this passage doesn't really seem like family life, but back then it kind of was because these people sometimes live with the family. family or Paul was writing about slaves and masters. This time I'm going to read you Paul's words from the New Living Translation. He said, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time and not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favorites. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul finished this thought, thought, and he said, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Now I'm sure that word slaves rang a bell. It's estimated at the time that Paul wrote this letter, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. 
That accounted for roughly half the population. Now, some people sold themselves into slavery as a way to, for their children to become Roman citizens. And their time of slavery was limited. But others became slaves when their homeland was conquered by another kingdom. And I think some were also likely born into slavery. The Bible does not condone slavery. In fact, Paul's teaching here to masters was revolutionary. Paul said that masters were to be fair and just. He spoke of slaves as people and not property. And then another one of Paul's letters, he urged the release of slaves. Slavery was not and will never be acceptable. Now, Paul wrote of slaves, but you know what he said could be directed towards employees and also what he speaks of masters, of managers in the workforce. And some of you that are working might think of yourself as a slave, but you're not. Paul wrote this, he said, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you ha also have a master in heaven. Now think of that master as a manager. And this is a reminder for a manager or anybody that's in a leadership role. Be fair and just. You might be the boss here on earth, but you have an all-powerful boss in heaven that you answer to, God. And so treat people with dignity and with respect. The best leader by far is the servant leader. If you want people to follow your lead, humble yourself. No task should be below you. Teach. Correct as appropriate, but don't be overly harsh. Don't be a slave driver. Paul's words to the slave are, are the worker, the employee, are equally important. Paul told slaves to obey their earthly masters in everything they do. Now, the, the word earthly there kind of stands out because that's in this world. The Christian's true master is God. And that being said, a, a good employee follows the instruction of his manager even when that task is unpleasant. Way back in my first job as a, as a chemist, my manager volunteered me to be on the safety committee. It kind of sounds like an honor, a and maybe it was, but part of the safety committee work was to manage the hazardous waste site every Friday. And that meant gloving up and masking up and gowning up to handle things that were unhealthy. I had to haul drums of toxic waste to the storage facility. I had to clean up the spills from coworkers who were sloppy when they were entering their containers. When it was 95 outside, you were drenched. When it was 20 outside, you were freezing, and you sometimes had ice on the top of the drum. You couldn't get it open. But you know what? If I wanted to keep my job, I had to be obedient. Now, of course, if the safety committee had recklessly put me in danger, I would have been right to decline doing that work. Like we said earlier, obedience is off the table when obeying it goes against the teaching of the Bible. For example, if you're in sales and your boss wants you to unfa unfairly inflate prices or do a bait and switch, don't do it. If your boss is unethical, lazy, acts inappropriately, don't go along with it. Speak up. Paul also said that we are to please our master even when they're not watching. There was a woman I knew years ago named Maggie. No relation to my dog. Maggie was a farm girl who worked for me at an agricultural company. And when I was around, Maggie was the picture-perfect employee. When I was out of the office, Maggie turned into the woman from hell. Her language would have made a sailor blush. Her attitude towards her workers was one of disdain. Her arrogance was a turnoff. She would leave the office for extended periods if I didn't happen to be there. Let's just say that I heard about Maggie's dual personality. And Maggie found a new opportunity to work at another job, which was better for her and better for our office. Sadly, we can sometimes be tempted to put on a show when the boss is around. And as soon as the boss is gone, our true self comes out. And Paul made it very clear, don't do it. 
We are to serve at work or church or wherever we volunteer with sincerity, remembering that God is aware of our actions. He's aware of our thoughts. We might be able to hide things from our boss for a while, but we cannot hide them from God. Paul added also, he said, work willingly at whatever you do as though, work, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. I want you to read that with me out loud again because I think this is really important. Let's say it together. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. It simply says we're working for Jesus. We give our best because we are Christians. We do it because we've been given a great gift through grace in Jesus Christ. If, if we seek to live for Christ, our family life and our life in general will be better and will look different. People will be drawn to us. Well, we've covered an awful lot today. Some of it might have felt a little overwhelming, but that being said, God's guidance here for family life is very straightforward. You can sum it up this way. Wives, show your husband respect. Husbands, love your wife with a Christ-like love. Kids, obey your parents. Parents, discipline your kids with love and encouragement. Managers, treat people with respect and dignity. And workers, do what your ba boss asks and always give your best. Remember, you're, you're ultimately working for Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read this passage and we hear your words for our relationships with our spouses, our kids, and extend that even to the people that work for us or who we work for. These words are simple, they're straightforward, but they're so challenging. Father, we look to your Son, our Savior, as the perfect example to follow. Help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to love our spouse with a Christ-like love. Help us to show respect. If we're, we're kids, even if we're grown kids, maybe remember to obey our parents. In our work, may we give our best. If we manage people, we may, may we treat them as Christ would treat them. And Father, when we fail... And, and every one of us fails, we come on our knees to you begging for forgiveness. We ask you to help us get back up, emp empower it, and strengthen us to live a life, a new life in Christ, a life that will change not only our family, but all those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.